The Voluntary Hardship Series is brought to you by Masculine Style. You know, I've worked with Tanner, the owner of Masculine Style, as my style coach for over a year now, and the transformation has been nothing short of incredible. In the same way we provide expert strength coaching at Barbell Logic and meeting clients where they are, Tanner is really a kindred spirit in style. He's an expert coach with incredible service, always making you feel heard. And because he's a longtime client of Barbell Logic Online Coaching, he knows how to help you find your own style rather than forcing you into something that you're not. His coaching has absolutely transformed the way I feel and carry myself and the way other people perceive me, whether in person or on video conference calls. It's been one of the best purchases I've made over the past 18 months. You can check him out and you can do that at masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. That's masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C for a special offer just for Barbell Logic listeners. Again, that's masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome, everybody, to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Nikki Sims here with Matt Reynolds. And we are re-releasing a bunch of our episodes on voluntary hardship, which if you listen to the intro of this podcast, you know, is very important to us. And since we started really identifying with that phrase back in 2017, we've actually learned a lot more about it and what it actually means and the different ways that it can really force you to grow or you can let it help you grow. And what we want to talk about today is kind of the different levels of voluntary hardship there. Matt, you just laid these out really well. You said there are kind of three different paths we could take, or was it two different paths? Yeah, two that are voluntary. I think one that's involuntary. <laughs> so <it's>, yeah. <laughs> you were talking about how there's this difference that you've noticed in voluntary hardship in taking on a hard thing that you're passionate about and focused on like a clear vision of what you believe in and what your core values are versus doing something hard just sort of forcing it on you because you think you should. Yeah. And not really because it's something that you really believe in. So we want to talk about that a little bit today. And then I just mentioned that I think one of the things that I don't know that I had ever said on the podcast in the past is that I actually, I know that we can also be refined by involuntary hardship and that we're not guaranteed to be refined by involuntary hardship. We know people who have to go to prison and are not refined by it actually come out worse or you know, deal with life's struggles and they don't get better from it. But I think that if you keep your eyes really focused on your core values and who you are and what you're trying to do, then I think you can be refined even by involuntary hardship. And I say that because we've been through a lot of hard things over the last few years and in the business and as a team. Yeah. And gosh, we've come out the other side better for it. We've thrived in the aftermath, but there were certainly times when it didn't feel like we were thriving. Right. And I think that's what gives you the answer as to whether is this voluntary hardship for the right reason or is this voluntary hardship for not the right reason is when you take it on, you're just like, cool, let's do this. I know there are going to be some struggles. There are going to be ups and downs, but I'm ready for it. And while it's difficult, it doesn't feel hard. Yeah. But if it's voluntary hardship for maybe the wrong reasons, you're doing it. And it's like some of the struggles we've had to go through in the business and, you know, people will probably relate to this personally is, you wake up and it feels hard every day. Yep. Like you can't feel inspired. You're not getting anything out of it except for difficulty. Yep. And that's that turmoil that I think people feel a lot where their actions just aren't really in line with what they don't understand yet is important to them. Mm. Or they're still living in that tail end of coming out of some sort of relationship where it's just like, this was hard for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's in the midst of it all, it's actually really difficult. When you're in the trenches, it's tough. You know, we talk about the adage that we use is the refining power of voluntary hardship. So the idea there is we are going to be refined by it and be better in the end because of the voluntary hardship. And so a very frustrating thing to do is to go through something hard and then have it be over and look back and go, oh, I'm no better for this, <laughs> having gone through it. That's very frustrating. <laughs> But you can change that, huh? Like, is that a mindset? Yeah, I I think it is for sure. Although I think that there's times that certainly I think that 
any hardship we go through in life ultimately can lead to us being refined as better people. We can learn lessons from it and come out the other side better than we were even often, you know, before we went into it. And so, but what's really cool, and I think what we were able to experience as a team at Barbell Logic is we understood the gravity of some of the things that we were going through while we were going through it. And so we understood that it was voluntary hardship and it was necessary and or even involuntary hardship and it was necessary. And so it felt like we were being refined by it even while we were in the trenches. It was drawing us closer together. And you know, I want to be careful about this. I got interviewed by a podcast not long ago that said a lot of times business owners or entrepreneurs or CEOs or founders or whatever talk about their staff as family. And do you think I'm family? And I was like, Mm-mm, nope. Which is now on a kind of interesting level, you know, you and I, and Andrew, some of the other, we're super close. I mean, you're some of my closest friends. I would probably consider you guys family, but for the most part, a business is a team. Yeah. You're a team. And if you don't perform, like you're expected to perform and we're here to perform together. And so, and yet you still see families, you see battalions in, you know, in battle. And certainly that's, I'm not trying to equate what we've been through is like wartime, but you see these super hard, involuntary refining processes and it draws them closer together. And I think for us, we were drawn closer together as a team at Barbell Logic. And for the listener, we've been through those things both as a team in Barbell Logic. And we've also watched so many of us on staff go through those things personally as well, both the involuntary hardships of you know, struggles with life or marriage or finances right. or health issues, health, yeah. all that stuff, as well as the pursuit of really hard things. You, know, you look at the choice that you've made to step up your game in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's really hard. And you get up super early in the morning, you go do it first thing in the morning. And it's not the same thing as going through a divorce or going through a lawsuit or dealing with cancer. And it's better, actually, because you get to choose this thing that is hard on some level, actually still really enjoyable. Yeah. Like you probably enjoy how hard it is and come out the other side and go like, this thing makes me better every single day. You know, I've heard you talk very passionately about yeah. it. It's yeah. A good ego check. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. But yeah, and then there are times like actually interesting example, just got hurt from it. Yeah. And so it's like, wait, so this was voluntary hardship that has now sprinkled a little bit of involuntary that's hardship. Right. And now I feel a little bit betrayed. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's what you said a minute ago is like, how are you going to deal with that involuntary hardship? Yep. And I think if you can get to a point where instead of it making you feel angry and discouraged, you start to see different opportunities from it. Sure. I feel like sometimes depending on how significant and involuntary hardship it is, it's like every five minutes you have to remind yourself to stay positive or sometimes it's like 24 hour ups and downs. But how are you going to pivot yourself? So you're like, oh, maybe I can make this a teaching experience. And, you know, what kind of perspective do I have to have where it's feeling like you're stuck in, you know, moments of pain versus like, oh, you know what? I'm going to be alive for another 50 years. Everything's going to be fine. Maybe. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. The more I have gone through hardship, both voluntary hardship and involuntary hardship in my life, it makes each time I go through the next future hardship a little bit easier. And that's really the point of this. And so, totally. you know, we've taken some criticism over the years for talking about this, about how squatting is a type of voluntary hardship and squats or just training in general for us is it's a hard thing that most people won't do. And some people look at that and go, man, you're equating that to like, you know, joining the Marines and going to war. Like, no, I'm not. I'm not. Both are voluntarily making a choice to do something hard. One has a lot more weight and a lot more gravity to it. Maybe the weightlifting has more weight and gravity to it, literally. (laughs) Uh, Figuratively, joining the Marines probably would. But it's all still voluntary hardship. And even, you know, I think one of the things that you'll see out of a lot of sort of entrepreneur people is it's like they'll take cold showers or they'll intermittent fast or like, and those are like some of the tiniest little things. Yeah. But I still think that you can, if you do them for the right reason, you know, I understand how some people would be like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but other people would be like, no, it's okay. You know, I, my wife and I went on this seven mile hike the other day. That is a long hike. That's a long hike for me. I realize there's a lot of people that are listening to this and are like, I do that every Saturday. I've walked by Matt lots of times and it's the shuffle. Sometimes it's a shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pre-Parkinson's. <laughs> so it's 
we, you know, we did actually really well. We had a blast doing the thing. Definitely the last couple miles were, and we were humping it. I mean, we were doing 16, <laughs> 17 minute miles for which again, people are going to hear that and be like, that's not fast, but it's, it's a fast walk. It's a fast shuffle. <laughs> Listen, man. Yeah, just, just kidding. Give me this hike, people. <laughs> you know, and my feet hurt afterwards. Yeah. And I, everything hurt. But I don't know. There was this thing that was just I was able to feel good about it. Yeah. And that's why I do it. I don't care what other people think. I don't care if other people are like, man, you know, that's ridiculous. And certainly our ability to take on levels of hardship differ by person and personality and what you're able to withstand. But I don't think it's a thing that you compare yourself to. I don't look at somebody else. You know, we've got people that work for us and, you know, they'll go out and ruck 25 miles. Like, I can't do that. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Seven mile hike. That's about what I got in me. You know, (laughs) I will carry all my groceries in with one trip from the car. That's right. Voluntary hardship. Hashtag voluntary hardship. (laughs) So it's so you're right. Coming back to your original question. Is it a mindset? And the answer is yes, it's a mindset. We can choose to do the hard things. And whether that is, you know, getting up at 430 in the morning or five in the morning, getting your work done and getting the urgent stuff out of the way, whether that is, you know, really focusing on trying to be the best spouse or husband or wife or father, you know, mom or dad or whatever that you can be, or working on your relationships or doing the best you can in your job or in your training, all of those things, we're choosing to do those hard things because we're trying to be better people ultimately. So how do you think it's helpful to approach these difficult things with the right mindset? And let me clarify that there are times when, like on the hike, it's just like, this is difficult and I'm enjoying every second of it. Yeah. Or it could be like, almost like a martyr thing. You're just like virtue signaling that like, this is difficult. Look at me. (laughs) Like, what do you find keeps you in a space where it's just like, it brings you joy versus a space where you're just like, "Ah, I need this for validation or whatever. That's a great question. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you what works for me. And I haven't actually thought about this. If this is a thing that I think would work for most, I take all of those things on like it's a competition, like it's a challenge. And it's not a competition with other people. It's a competition with myself. So when I think like, you know, I'm like, I looked at the hike and I said, oh, it's a one-way hike, 3.6 miles, something like that. So I thought, that's one, it's one way. There's no loop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, you're walking that one and you're like, you know, and then you get to like 2.5. You're like, we only have one mile left. We got to make it one mile to the end. But then you're like, you know, you got to turn around and come back another 3.5, 3.6. Right. And so I just, you know, I take it on as a challenge. I can remember Hambrick used to make fun of me all the time for all the surgeries that I've had. You know, I've had appendectomy and I've had hernia surgeries and I've had my gallbladder out oh, and man. all these things. It's a party in that gut. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, my, my driver's license says take what's left. There's nothing. There's no, <laughs> but probably not the liver. Actually, can you put more in? That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I take a new liver. <laughs> Even when I've had surgeries, and of course, those are all like really minor surgeries. I just, my mindset is, and not publicly, you know, I'm not like posting this stuff on social media, like I'm going to dominate this hernia surgery. But <laughs> honestly, in my brain, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm going to, I'm going to dominate this seven mile hike. I didn't even say that to my wife. You know, like it was just like, we're doing this thing together. And of course, part of me was like, man, I better be able to do this if my 44 <laughs> year old wife cannot get, <laughs> cannot get out, you know? And so that's the way I handle And honestly, that I think it's actually really similar. I think the same thing when I have you know, tough drama with my kids, when I'm going through the federal lawsuit (laughs) and whatever it is, I'm just like, okay, okay. This is an opportunity to be refined. This is an opportunity to like, you know, show what you've got and what you're made of. And here we go. Let's take on the challenge. And you were with me. There've been lots of times over the last few years that were very, very hard. And I'm not wired to be depressed, but there were times when for a day or two or, you know, a couple of days, I was just, man, I was just kind of down in the dumps because it was just, it was tough. But you also know that at no point was I ever like, this is going to ruin us. Right. Yeah. And this, I think, is really interesting because it really speaks to your character and what one of the most important values that really drove the company and continues to drive the company is that you will commit to doing something to the best of your abilities. And if you know there's something better than your ability, you'll learn about it and do it that way. And that you will choose what's right. And so that we've had tons of tough conversations where it's just like, well, we have to do what's right. (laughs) And that I think goes to show that the way you approach voluntary hardship and what you decide to take on or to not take on is really indicated by what's important to you. Yeah, it's interesting. So the other side of that, I'll kind of pose this as a question to you to see what you think. And I don't know that I know the answer to this is, 
There are people who, lots of people, who choose voluntary hardship because they understand that it is good for them and it's that taking the spoonful of medicine. I don't think they find joy or enjoyment in the hardship, but they understand the long-term refinement that comes out of it, so they do it, and I think there's still value in that, but that is not the way I typically approach those things. Yeah. Pretty rare that I have something, I mean, there's definitely been plenty of involuntary hardship that I'm like, boy, I sure wish I didn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. But for most of the voluntary hardship stuff, it's, you know, a spoonful of medicine. It's like, I don't know, I play mind games with myself. Like, okay, here we go. Let's a challenge, let's do this thing. It's gonna be an adventure, let's hammer it, you know? And so that's the way I look at it. So I certainly don't know that my way is better than, and I actually think it's probably easier to handle my way than I have a lot of respect for people who are able to do a thing that they really hate because <laughs> they still know that it refines them and makes them better in the end. Uh, I'm not great at that. Yeah. Yeah. Like the spoonful of medicine people for lifting. I'm just like, wow, I'm impressed. I know. I love to train. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> like if I had to run for a spoonful of medicine. Nope. Uh -uh. I would just know that I was going to take a bunch of medicine later on in my life. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm interested. Run. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting. But it really does come back to what you said. It's the mindset. Mm -hmm. And so I think even if you've come through, I and mean, I think what's really important takeaway there is there are listeners right now who are probably thinking of both times that they chose to do something hard and times that they did not, that they had involuntary hardship thrust upon them. And they're sitting right now and going, I'm no better for that. You can actually change your mindset right now or in the next few hours or few days can still be refined by a hardship from the past. I really believe that, right? Like the relationship you screwed up, the finances you screwed up, the job you lost, the whatever, that maybe right now today you're not refined by it. You're no better. You look back on it with extreme regret. I think there's a way to take that and have a paradigm shift in your mindset to go, I can actually look at this different and say, like, what lessons were there to be learned? Yeah. And you can learn those things. You know, I've talked about this on the podcast before. You and I have had to do this many times in the business with staff or clients or different relationships. We have to have awkward conversations with people all the time. That's the nature of a business of size at this point. I hate awkward conversations. You hate awkward. <laughs> like, I've met very few people in life that like those things. <laughs> They're awful. And yet, every time I have one, the next one is easier. Yeah. I used to avoid awkward conversations. I think a lot of people avoid those things, avoid confrontation, and it becomes a cancer. It's like all you can do is think about it. And I'm at a point where, you know, one of the things I really champion in my life is sort of living efficiently. And so if there's a thing that's taking up all this bandwidth in my brain that's sort of eating away like a cancer, I'm going to deal with it, even though it's hard and I don't want to. Okay. Let's have this talk. We got to have this talk and get it over with because it's, I don't have the bandwidth for this anymore. Yeah. And again, I think it's a mindset shift. You know, if you've been lifting for a while, you've probably made significant changes to your body, good changes, positive changes. And after changing your build, your old clothes aren't going to fit anymore. And if you just buy new sizes of the same thing, you'll minimize the effect of how much you've transformed. By improving your style, especially in the middle of your fitness journey, you give yourself a mental win and get to see a whole new version of yourself in the mirror. And this helps solidify in your own mind that you're making progress and that you'll be at your target strength and build before you know it. So whatever the reasons were that you started to lift, you've likely found other unexpected benefits, improvements to your mental health, your relationships, your energy levels, and your self-respect. Thankfully, getting stronger isn't the only way to level up in all those other aspects of your life and improving your style, I've personally found, will help compound all the progress you've made with your strength training. Coach Tanner at Masculine Style can help you with those steps. Coach Tanner has been my coach. He's the owner of Masculine Style and longtime Barbell Logic online coaching client. He's helped me for about 18 months now and just completely transformed my style. Not trying to make me something I'm not, but to actually feel more comfortable in exactly who I am. And so it's been a tremendous benefit to me, the way I carry myself, the way I feel about myself, 
which is more important to me even than the way other people perceive me, but even the way other people perceive me has, I think, changed and transformed dramatically over the last year and a half, just by the way I carry myself and the way I dress. And so it's more than just clothes, it's a mindset, it's a lifestyle. And we're thankful for Masculine Style, for Coach Tanner, for supporting the Voluntary Hardship Series. Go and check him out. He is an expert coach that is a kindred spirit to what we do at Barbell Logic. He focuses on service and high touch, one-on-one coaching with his clients. This isn't something where you're thrown into a class, but he spends lots of time with his clients. And it's been absolutely one of the best purchases I've made over the past year and a half. You can check him out. He's got a special deal just for Barbell Logic listeners at masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. That's masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. It's time to level up your style. You spent all this time getting stronger, carrying yourself better, changing your body. Now it's time to bring the style up to the same standards as your strength. Masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. Have you noticed anything recently that you looked back on? You were just like, man, I'm still kind of angry about that. I don't think that was worth my time. And then you (laughs) did have a switch and you're like, okay, I am going to decide to learn this about it. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I don't know if I I can share. Okay. You know, I have a tendency, you know this about me, to not publicly hold grudges, but like internally hold grudges. And I'm not talking about for people that know some of the background, I'm not talking about this big picture stuff. I'm Mm. talking about somebody at the grocery store that I semi knew one time that used to go to my gym slided me and I'm like, I'll kill their whole family one day. (laughs) You know, I'm not really, you know, I remember one time when I was going to this is sort of a vulnerable story that I don't think I've told before. I remember once when I really found a great counselor psychologist that I was going to, she was asking me, Dr. Hudson, shout out Dr. Hudson. (laughs) She was asking me about you know, did I have grudges? It was, that wasn't the term she used, but like grudges or, you know, bad feelings about how many people in my life. And I was like, I don't know, none. I think I'm good with everybody. And she's like, man, eh, probably not. <laughs> and I opened up my phone and went to my contact list and started in the A's and started working through. And oh, I was like, yeah. oh, there's like 400 people in here. I hate <laughs> seriously hate or have grudges. Against. I mean, my very first, well, yeah, I mean, I'm just yeah. a little bit of Reynolds exaggeration. I didn't hate him. I didn't want him to die. But my first thought about that person was negative. Ah. One time that person told me I wasn't a good strength coach mm. and I don't like them mm-hmm. forever, you know? And so I often have to think through things like that where, you know, you know, there were times when they're probably right. They probably told me that in 2002 and I was a terrible strength coach in 2002, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so... Yeah, I think there's a lot of times where, at least from a relationship standpoint, I look back and go, yeah, I screwed that up. I played a role in that that was poor. I came out of that relationship, you know, on the other side that was like gross. And when I can think about it, I can actually be refined by the thing if I think. And I'm like, oh, I can learn from this even now, even though yesterday I had this sort of pent up emotion and animosity for that relationship. Like, I, I don't have to have that. And then to recognize that, like, letting that thing go, it's not even about, giving something to that person or to that relationship that was strained. It's giving something back to yourself. Like, yes, exactly. It's holding this negativity in my own life for me. And so I don't want that person or that relationship to have that sort of power over my life anyway. So I think that's where it plays itself out most often for me. Like in those actual physical things or even involuntary hardships with family or, you know, really intense stuff. I seem to handle those well. I seem to handle the physical hardships well. It's really those sort of like middle of the road personal relationships like, oh, that person slided me. That person did me wrong. I'm not going to like them forever. <laughs> and then I later think about it. and I'm like, you know what? Why am I holding on to this? Yeah. And so I figure out how I can learn. It's like you have to feel that uncomfortableness to know that it's not worth it. But if you're yeah. just like, ah, oh, screw it. I'm just going to continue to be mad at them the whole time instead of being like, why is this making me feel this kind of animosity to that person and you can kind of dig into it. And I totally agree. Like I've had situations like that where it's just like, you know what? They are their own microcosm of histories and actions and emotions that I can't have responsibility for, but they made me feel a certain way because of X, Y, Z. And if I just like forgive myself for that, then it's just like, okay, yep. now that hardship that I was putting upon myself can just go away. <laughs> right. It's like so, kind of processing through things that aren't worth having hardship about. <laughs> do you have any relatively recent 
things that you can think of, whether that's a physical hardship that was voluntary or relational or emotional or social that you had to go through that you were like, okay, this was maybe something that you didn't expect to have to go through, or maybe you chose to do it that was hard and that you can look back now and say, I figured out how to be refined by this thing when I maybe I wasn't in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, man. So many, so many to choose from. <laughs> kind of an interesting example. I thought it was interesting. Like here in California, it's clearly I pay a ton of money for rent. <laughs> yeah. And the weather tax. Yeah. I pay a lot for the beautiful weather, which is overcast and gloomy right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I choose to take that on. That's my voluntary hardship that I'm there totally okay with it. Yeah. But you get to the point where you're just like, oh, I'm living in this place forever. And I start to just like look at everything around me and hate it about my apartment. Mm. And so my mindset turned into a negative atmosphere about something that I've actually chose to take on. And what I did was that's when I got that Sparking Joy book that I can't stop laughing about. <laughs> I bought both. I bought the Spark Joy and then I bought the first one. The other one, I have it right next to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the that's really good. Life changing power of tidying, tidying up, up or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. I got them both. And I went through that whole process and it totally gets you back to the point. And like, honestly, the whole process of tidying was like kind of, it was like exhausting. And so hold on, let's give some background. So for those of you, you've all heard of Marie Kondo. Marie Kondo, sweet lady. She has a Netflix show called Tidying Up. And it's the process of organizing, cleaning your house that I think transcends just your, I'm getting super woo woo, like transcends your house organization into like you deciding what's really important to you. Yeah. Yeah. You said that really well. If you're not careful, it feels a little kumbaya like, yeah. but it really is this sort of like, <laughs> hey, we collect, we are a materialistic yes. culture and yeah. we collect a lot of crap and 90% of that crap doesn't bring us joy. It just takes up space. Don't get hung up on the semantics of the word. That's right. Just takes up space. And you yeah. just get it. And you're like, I don't know. Like, maybe I'll use it one day. Yeah. No, you throw it away. Like, give it away. She teaches you how to walk through your house, really. And really not even by room, but she goes by... By category. By category. By category. And, uh, you know, you can do clothes. And you can go like, man, I got all these clothes that maybe one day I'll wear. Right. But like, it doesn't bring me joy at all. And I don't, you know, and so it's, so you figure out how to... So it's almost a way to take on a form of, I don't even know that minimalism is the right word, but it's just like, listen, I'm just going to be surrounded with stuff. If I own it, it's going to be good for me. It's going to bring me joy. And it's based off of, you decide to keep it in your life if you know you want to have it in your future state that you actually sit down and brainstorm. You're just like, oh, what's the lifestyle that I actually really want to lead? Yes, right. And so that was cool because you're just, you don't, it doesn't really take into account where you are right now. You're just like, well, how do I imagine my life? Then you kind of take inventory. So did you get rid of the Subaru? still have my car. <laughs> I really like my car. The future Nikki still wants to drive a Subaru. Okay. All right. All right. Honestly, for how much I'm paying in rent, the car <laughs> that I would want to have, I can't have right now. Yeah, I gotcha. <laughs> but just shout out to Subaru. It has all the bells and whistles for not costing an arm and a leg. That's and great. <laughs> Andrew has two of them. You have one. And Andrew says the mortality rate in a Subaru is zero. No one has ever died in the history of the world in a Subaru, evidently, according to Andrew Jackson. So. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's true. <laughs> Safest car of all time. So, But that whole process, like you decide to take it on, which you, it really does. Like your life is just kind of a mess for a little while because you're literally supposed to compile everything in one category and put it on the floor in front of you so you can go through it. Yeah. So you kind of have to confront like, oh, why do I still have this? I don't want this. Yes, please. Let me take this with me. And by the end, it like makes you really enjoy where you are. And appreciate that what you have with you is something that you want to be with you in the future. And so it got me back into being a place where I'm just like really happy with where I'm at. Yeah. And so it was, and I haven't changed my location. I didn't move, but it's just like, it was kind of a good pivot to take in mindset wise. Yeah, it was a paradigm shift for you. Yeah. I've noticed that has applied also into different even into work too, it's just when you come into like a conversation or for reviewing a process and it's just like, this doesn't feel like it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Then you are just like, well, do we have to keep doing it? Because right. someone said like, that's how you do business. Or do you take that opportunity to be like, you know what? We can do whatever we want with this business and we can make it the business that we want it to be. That's right. So let's take on the work that it's going to entail to be the company that we want to be and surround ourselves with a team that we want to surround ourselves with instead of just being like, you know what, we have to do it because 
XYZ said so, and yeah, that's just right. the cost of doing business. So it, it's like you get to choose and you get to say yes or no to certain things yep. in order to really fulfill like the lifestyle or the company or the team that you imagine. Well, I think even, I think it's important that I say this because I don't think you would about yourself or about your position, but you know, your title has really recently changed in the company, even though your job description really hasn't. So your title has traditionally been for the last several years, your VP of HR, human resources, which everyone hates. <laughs> <laughs> Who likes human resources? <laughs> Nobody does, including you, right? I really don't. And so... <laughs> There are parts of human resources that you've figured out how to make it very valuable to the company and enjoyable to the company. And what that has really morphed into is what we now call the VP of experience, both for staff and clients, right? And so we've got a team that does client experience and we've got an HR team, but you kind of lead that entire team. And so you get to think about how do I make everyone's experience that interacts with Barbell Logic the best it can possibly be. And so I've watched you grow in your joy for your position over the last, really even over the last like six months in sort of having that paradigm shift over the way it felt rather than when your job, especially, and people don't know this, we moved from an LLC to a C-Corp at the end of last year, which mm -hmm. required you to refile with all of the states that we have employees in, which is like 17 different states. And there was and so you're doing all this paperwork and registrations and state taxes, and it's awful. It's like really not a fun way it to spend involuntary your day. hardship. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very good. But you were able to take that. And first off, you hired an assistant who could take on a lot of that monotonous sort of stuff, who yeah. was also skilled at that. And that was her skill set. And it allowed you to really focus on people and the experience and yeah. connection. And so you're really passionate about that. So you were able to take this thing that is traditionally this like, I've joked on the podcast before, like Toby from the office and be like, that's not me and that's not who we're gonna be. Right. And you've been able to define our HR team as now the experience team. We yeah. don't call it HR anymore, even though that's still what it is. And you know what's really hilarious and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this is I didn't even know that like <laughs> there were like CX, like VP of CX, customer client experience. Like I didn't yeah. know that was a thing. And just like last week, I found all the podcasts and books on it. And I'm so freaking nice. excited about it. Because <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is what I've just been stumbling through yeah. for the last couple of years. And I gotta say, we're like really good at it already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm excited cool. to see more of what we can do for employee experience and staff experience and client experience. Yeah. It's really fun when you read books like that and you're like, oh, we're already doing like 90% of this. Yeah. Like, oh, you guys have churn problems? Like, oh. Yeah. Right. And then so you're like, it's always cool when you read a book and you're like, we only have to tweak five or 10%. Yeah. I can imagine it'd be very overwhelming to read books like that and be like, we're doing it all wrong. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> yeah. We got to change everything. So it's now, and I think we're in a good place to talk about this right now because our listeners, those who have been with us for all these years, have watched us walk through the good times and the bad times. And, the, you know, it's sort of a roller coaster. And we're in really great times right now. Probably the best we've ever been. Our business has grown at a pace that it's never grown before. Our staff is uber healthy. The leadership team is just firing on all cylinders. We've got major projects that we've launched over the last month or two that have just been incredible. And so... But when I look back at the process of all of those things, I mean, there were some hard times, even in the last month, right? Some heavy stresses, getting major projects launched. And then later you look back and you're like, wow, we actually did all that. I mean, we had a meeting this morning, a leadership meeting where really you guys report back to me how May went and what the vision is for June for each of these sort of categories in the business for operations and experience, HR, things like that marketing. And gosh, when we went through the stuff that the team accomplished in May, it was like, this Man. is unbelievable. Huge. This and is we unbelievable. still were able to take a holiday off. Yeah. We it still didn't do anything over Memorial Day. Yeah, that's exactly like, right. That's a yep. huge deal. Like we all used to work eight hours a day, almost seven days a week. Seven days a week. That's right. There was no difference between weekends and weekdays. Yeah. It was just all just a blur of work. Yep. And I think that's a huge win, win for the company for sure. Yeah. It's good for our health. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's the kind of HR person I want to be. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of HR person you are. And that's who we want at the business. So I think the big takeaway with this is that really voluntary hardship and even involuntary hardship is often more of a mindset than anything else. And so you can choose to do a hard thing. There are times that you should choose to do a hard thing for the right reasons. And there's times that 
if you're choosing hard things just because you think you should and you're not passionate about it, you're not really sure how it would refine you, but somebody else told you you should do it because, you know, it's that, you know, I've got to get up at 4.30 in the morning because all the entrepreneurs say I should hashtag rise and grind, but I hate it. You know, I've changed my outlook on that. You know, I recognized this not that long ago is that, you know, I get up super early in the morning. I love it. I don't set my alarm. I got up at 4.14 this morning. <laughs> I never set my just alarm. Ready I just ready to do it. Like, let me get ready that to espresso. Go. I'm re- I mean, I piss everybody off in the house because I'm just like so excited when I wake up in the morning. But at 8.15 at night, my IQ drops 30 points right. and I can't do anything. I'm like completely aware of this. And I'm like, I think I'm going to bed. And everybody's like, it's 8.15. It's going to be light outside for another hour. And that's so it would be voluntary hardship for me if I actually stayed awake at nighttime. But so, you know, if you're the opposite of me, Just because I or some entrepreneur or somebody else says that you have to get up at 4.30 in the morning and you hate everything about it and you try it for two weeks and two weeks later, you still hate it. Yeah. Then it's it's not the right move for you. That's not the right voluntary hardship piece, right? And then, you know, we've talked about this. uh, Brett McKay sort of planted this seed not that long, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe in me, where he talked about that common term. You hear people say it's discipline over motivation, discipline over motivation. I actually think that's true for a short period of time, but... My experience is if discipline doesn't turn into motivation within a couple of weeks, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. There's got to be some joy in the process. That's right. You know, I'm down 44 pounds. Ah, so I've good. loved every minute of it. I haven't, this has not been hard at all. So cool. I mean, I don't feel like I'm dieting. I don't feel like I'm depriving myself. You know, I talked to Jillian this morning. She's like, I can't, your numbers like every week, that's crazy. And I didn't feel very good about Memorial Day because we hosted two days in a row and I drank a little more than, I was over my calories, like 170 mm-hmm. calories. Like oh. we're not like 500 calories. It was yeah. like, it was like, I shouldn't have had that one extra drink, you know? And she was like, bro, you're down 44 pounds, you know? And so, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And so, you know, has it been hard? I, yeah, I guess, but I've actually learned how to enjoy the thing and Rachel enjoys it. We're doing it together. It's just, so again, dieting's maybe one of those perfect examples. It's just not, and I don't even think dieting's not the right word for what I'm doing. I'm eating in a sustainable, I can, Rachel said this the other day. She's like, we can do this for the rest of our life. This is not hard at all. For sure. You know, it's still, there's a, would I like to still go eat, you know, a, Bacon King cheeseburger from a, from Burger King. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, like, I hate the way it makes me feel. It doesn't mean I can't right. have a cheeseburger once in a while. I can. I did. I did earlier this week. I had one with Brett. So it's that mindset shift. Yeah. It really is. You can diet and be like, I hate every second of this. Right. Or you can take it on as a challenge and figure out how to make it habit based and sustainable and enjoy it. Right. Yeah. You can do the same thing with your job. You can hate your job and have that constant outlook. I hate my job. I hate my boss. I hate my coworkers, all this sort of stuff. Or you can figure out how to turn it into a challenge and be like, I'm going to be the best I can possibly be. I'm going to yeah. be the best trash man I can possibly be. I'm going to be yeah. the best whatever. You can really take a lot of ownership and pride in the choices that you make yeah. and in the things that you decide not to take on. And so when you do that, that's what leads to the refinement. Yeah. Whether it's voluntary or involuntary. So love voluntary hardship. I hope you guys love the podcast series that we're going to put out this week and hear really sort of the history behind the voluntary hardship story and that phrase and what it means to us. You know, I hope you can kind of see the growth and transition of that over the last several years to see like, here's what it kind of meant to us in 2017. It's not completely different in 2021, but it's grown up and matured some. I think that's maybe the best way to look at it. So as those, a lot of times those sort of philosophical things that you're grabbing onto in their earlier days are unrefined and sort of green, And the more you kind of chew on it and live it and don't just talk about it. I think you know this about us. We try not to just pay lip service to things, but when we grasp onto a thing, we really pursue it. So voluntary hardship has been a major piece of our core value system over the last several years. And that sort of choosing to do what's right, no matter what, whether it's best for us or not, whether it's hard or not, we choose to do what's right. And so it's been fun to kind of watch that process grow in us over the past four years. Big time. Yeah. So. So enjoy the series that's coming up. You get to see all this fun history in the Voluntary Hardship series. We'd love to hear, by the way, we'd love to hear stories of voluntary hardship. So you can reach out to us. We'd love to hear those and even talk about those in a future Q&A episodes. We'll have links in the show notes always that you can reach out and talk to us on the podcast, ask us questions on the podcast. And Nikki and I will see those. Uh, We'd love to see your comments and get five-star reviews. If this podcast has brought you value, we would love to have that as well. And And so enjoy the rest of the series and we will be back and talk to you again fresh and new next Monday. We'll see you then.